Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Please take your seats. We have another fantastic session for you here on day three of the Aspen Security Forum. Let me take just two minutes to describe all of the amazing themes we heard from today. Uh, there are two themes that were loud and clear in the content that we've had from this morning until just now over in Door Hosier. One, even in these really complex times, there are real reasons for optimism. And in pretty fundamental ways, we are shifting the international system to meet this new moment. And second, we heard this over and over again, we're all stronger when we're in it together. So let me give you some examples, some reasons for optimism. The head of MI6, uh, Richard Moore, said to us that winter is coming for Russia. They were defeated in the Battle of Kiev, and they're going to find it increasingly difficult to find manpower and supply material. And he complimented the US and European response to that brutal invasion. Kent Walker discussed how the private sector is supporting allied intelligent agencies. That's new and innovative. On NATO, we had Kay Bailey Hutchinson and Evo Dalder reminding us that NATO is stronger despite the name calling and sometimes contentious relationships over the last few years. Boy, we just emerged stronger and we added two powerful new members to the alliance. On food security, the situation is pretty dire right now as Mike Froman and others reminded us, but there's a lot that's happening with technology to integrate small farmers and integrate them more in the international system. And even amidst the tragedy of Afghanistan, Ambassador Raz said to us that even though we've lost the country, we haven't lost the people of Afghanistan. So let's be reminded to that and make sure we don't forget about that part of the world. And the second theme is, came across over and over again, is that we are stronger when we're working together across political parties and with our international partners. Um, ambassador Kamani, the Kenyan ambassador to the United Nations, reminded us that the US is very strong in Africa when their policy is based on bipartisanship. When it's not, they say we feel like we have whiplash and things change every four years. Former Secretary of Defense Bob Gates and Jane Harmon took a bipartisan selfie. <laughs> and, and Bob said to us that Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin have accomplished something that no one other human on earth has. They've unified Republicans and Democrats in Congress. And finally, a real note of optimism and new and creative thinking. So we had Israeli Defense Minister Benny Gantz and a senior official from the Bahraini Foreign Ministry described the Abraham Accords and all of the out-of-the-box thinking and the real new security structure you now have in the Middle East. All of this proves that positive change is actually possible and, in fact, happening if we put our minds to it. We now have a really very special session. We are going to hear from Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo. She is with us virtually rather than in person because she must be the busiest woman in Washington right now trying to get the very important CHIPS Act across the finish line. And there to interview her is our former Secretary of Commerce, Penny Pritzker. Thank you. Secretary Raimondo, welcome. We are so thrilled to have you. Thank you very much for being here. Um, you're in a person of extraordinary accomplishment in so many realms, uh, but as uh, Anya said, right now you are on the front lines of getting the CHIPS Act uh, passed uh, Congress, and we're all very grateful for all that you're doing. What I wanted to ask you is, can you tell us why do we need this bill? Why is it so important? Where does it stand and what's in it? Well, first let me say thank you. And this is um, special for me to be interviewed by you, Secretary Pritzker. <laughs> um, Penny has been a good 
friend for a long time. And when I was thinking of taking this job, she couldn't have been more generous with her time. And so I want to thank you and acknowledge that. I also want you guys to know that it's about 100 degrees and humid in Washington. So I am very jealous that you are in Aspen. Um, but I am back here trying to get the CHIPS Act across the finish line. We are so close. This will happen. This is going to happen. It has to happen. Uh, and uh, the reason, to answer your question, honey, and everyone there, I, I think, knows this, um, there's a couple of problems. Number one, um, chips are ubiquitous. They're in everything. Everything digital or electronic requires chips. But the fact of the matter is, since our economy is moving to a more digitized economy, every business now, every industry is a tech industry, is a digital industry, which means the demand for semiconductors is, is through the roof, unprecedentedly high. It's gone up about 17% in the past two years, and chip demand will increase by another 20 to 25% in the next four to five years. So uh, the fact of the matter is we don't have enough supply. C combined with that, um, chip manufacturing facilities globally are operating at max capacity. Uh, the US is dangerously reliant on other countries. So why does it matter? It matters. It matters because we have this um, problem where this is a uniquely important cornerstone technology for a digital economy underpinning all innovation, and by the way, military innovation and equipment, and yet we don't have enough domestic supply. And where do we stand with the bill? Uh, so, you know, as I say, very close. Um, we had a huge and important vote, procedural vote, earlier this week. Uh, 64 senators, bipartisan vote, 64 senators uh, voted to allow the bill to go forward. They will take their um, final vote on Monday evening in the Senate and then send it to the House. And I expect that by this time next week or maybe by the end of next week, the House will have passed the bill. And so where I am now, the, the reason I wasn't able to join you in person is we are literally just whipping the votes in the House, trying to have a big bipartisan vote uh, in order to get this over the finish line. And I believe it will happen. I will say this. Um, my own view is that it's, it's vital that this happens. We can't wait anymore. I also think it's important that it happens with wide margins because the world is watching. The world is watching. Can America's democracy produce? The Senate passed the USICA bill, its version of this bill, one year ago. In the time since they passed it in the Senate, France has already passed legislation and is right now um, incentivizing companies. Same with Germany, same with Japan, same with India, et cetera. We need to move now and we need to show the world we can get things done, big things with a big margin and a bipartisan vote. And so that's what I'm driving towards. And I believe by this time next week, we will have accomplished that. So one last question about this. So when we started the, uh, with the Obama Semiconductor Initiative in 2015 and did the PCAST report in 2016, I never would have imagined uh, that the Department of Commerce would get $52 billion um, to basically oversee. Uh, this funding is more than five times the department's yearly budget. So how do you plan to stand up this critically important uh, program and what challenges are you gonna face with an entirely new and massive program of this import? Yes. Uh by the way, this $50 billion is on top of $50 billion that we received from Congress uh, to implement a broadband initiative. So uh, we're busy. We are busy. I will say I, I feel grateful to have a lot of executive experience. I'm a very hands-on implementer. And so we have been preparing for months. The only good news that it's taken Congress so long to pass it is that we've had time to prepare 
And that's exactly what we've been doing. So we did a survey of the industry to find out, you know, where is their real lack of supply uh, and where is the demand now and where is it growing? We have a good feel for, um, you know, the technologies, where the U.S. is particularly vulnerable. By the way, if you, if you want to be up all night worrying, <laughs> the United States doesn't make any really leading edge chips in the United States. We buy 90% from Taiwan. I don't need to tell anyone in this audience why that is a scary proposition. Our dependence on Taiwan for the sophisticated chips is untenable and unsafe. Um, so anyway, we have or we are we are bulking up. We will have to hire a team. I intend to hire people who are technologists as well as implementers as well as finance people. You know, the vast majority of money needs to come from the private sector. Our 52 billion needs to turn into hundreds of billions. And so we need to incentivize, we need to crowd in private capital. This entire effort I, I envision will be a public private partnership. And, and the vision to be clear, isn't just you know, providing some tax incentives to build a half a dozen new fabs in America, although we do need that. What we're, what we're playing for here is a revitalization of the entire ecosystem from research and development to design to software to fabrication to packaging and and everything around it you know the substrate companies the chemical companies the wafer companies the silicon companies and so we have been creating a strategic plan to recreate that creating 100,000 plus high paying jobs in America and we'll have we will build a team accordingly in order to execute and frankly have a lot of accountability this is a lot of taxpayer money and every penny has to be accounted for and transparent and competitively bid so it's um you could come back and help if you wanted to because we, <laughs> we definitely mm, we'll, di we'll discuss that part later <laughs> yeah anyone in that audience i can't see who's there um but but seriously i i need people to help like this is a this is a Sputnik Sputnik moment for America, I mean that very sincerely, and this is a project worth working on. So switching gears a little bit, Secretary, um, you know that many people don't know that the Department of Commerce is really the federal government's innovation agency because of its leadership in digital policy, patents and trademarks, export controls, broadband, uh, and houses much of the government's data. Uh, in the historic infrastructure bill, um, the National Telecommunication Information Administration, NTIA, which is a part of the Department of Commerce, as you referenced, received about $50 billion uh, uh, to, provide private, uh, to provide broadband grants. You know, too many Americans still don't have access to high-speed uh, broadband uh, and affordable broadband. Uh, I saw it during the pandemic in Chicago. We had to have a private sector effort to bring in there's and the Jim Crown and Paula Crown are sitting in the front row here. They were a big part of, of bringing private sector dollars to 100,000 families in Chicago that didn't have access to um, high speed broadband or affordable broadband. So this is a real equity problem. How do you see the Biden administration's program contributing to broadband equity and helping people who need affordable and reliable access to participate in everything from school um, to the global economy? Yeah, thank you. First, let me say hello to Jim and Paula. Good friends, I wish I could be with you in person. Um, look, right now we have tens of millions of Americans who don't have access to broadband. 50% of people who live in tribal lands in America don't have access to broadband. A third of people who live in rural America don't have access to broadband. And many millions of American people live in communities where there's broadband. You know, there's there are fiber in their neighborhood, but it's 80, 90, $100 a month and so it might as well not be available to them because it's unaffordable. By the way, I saw this as a governor of Rhode Island during COVID. We, so many children um, couldn't go to school. 
because they didn't have broadband. It was in their community, but it didn't hook up to their uh, high rise or their uh, you know, assisted living facilities. I was recently in North, uh, South Carolina, rural South Carolina, and a, an older gentleman was telling me how his wife passed away because they live in rural South Carolina. They weren't anywhere near a hospital or a doctor and they didn't have broadband, which is what was necessary for her to continue to see her doctor, uh, you know, virtually. And, and so he lost his wife. So this is, this is you know, ground zero of equity. Um, Internet for all is our tagline. Again, this is a Herculean implementation task. We've hired well over 100 people. Um, I'm running kind of a military style operation of implementation because we're running the money through the states. We're requiring every state to show us a plan and we're not approving any plan until we are satisfied that every person in that state will have affordable internet at the end of the day. So it's a ton of engagement, engagement with the private sector, engagement with cities, tribes, communities, nonprofits, schools, and it's a, it will be a challenge. I should also say, here again, I'm calling on the private sector to dig in, um, in every way. You know, the internet service providers, they need to provide affordable plans. If they're going to receive taxpayer subsidy, I told they, it has to be affordable. Affordable is $10 a month or free, not $100 a month. They have to accept the vouchers from the federal government uh, for low-income people. They need to work with us to let us know where our folks unserved and underserved. And so far, they've been fantastic. I want to give a shout out to them. Um, so this, this will be difficult. Here again, job creation opportunity. We don't have enough people right now in the labor market to lay the fiber necessary to do the hookups. So we're putting a portion of the money, as we will do with the CHIPS money, for apprenticeships and training. And I think it's a huge opportunity to, to target women and people of color, and, you know, it, like in tribal uh, lands, to make sure that the people who live there are the people who are trained, who are doing the installation. So this, it's a massive effort, uh, not dissimilar from rural electrification, but it underpins America's ability to be competitive in the world. And it's a huge, huge equity issue, uh, you know, as you said. So, Secretary, switching gears to the U.S.-China relationship, which has become only increasingly complicated, it feels like it's moved from engagement to competition to, in some respects, adversarial. And as Secretary of Commerce, you play a vital role, not just in the economic engagement with China, but also as, from a national security standpoint, regulating sensitive dual technologies, for example, and other uh, parts of our, working with other parts of our government on CFIUS and other uh, different types of activity. What can the federal government do to help U.S. businesses to be globally competitive and avoid becoming it, it caught up in an adversarial relationship with China uh, and creating or having greater geopolitical tensions? Yeah, a, a, a good question, a difficult question, and in a dynamic situation. So the, you know, President Biden's strategy as it relates to China revolves around a few principles, investing, competing, aligning with our allies, and cooperating where we can. Um, I tend to focus, uh, my own view is I think the investing portion is probably the most important of those pillars, uh, which is to say, and this is how we benefit business, there's only so much we can do to slow down China. And we need to do that. You know, that's the compete component. We need to be clear-minded about our export controls, deny China technology from the US that will allow them an edge and enforce that. And we are doing that. Um, we need to protect our IP. We need to you know, protect our businesses from their unfair practices of 
you know, dumping, you know, cheap steel and aluminum into our economy and undermining our ability to have a productive steel base in the United States. And so we have to do all that and do it with gusto. And I put that into the category of protection and slowing China down. But I'm very focused on helping America to run faster, which is in the invest bucket, which is what we've been talking about. Uh, you know, China announced last, or didn't announce, it was reported last night that China can make a seven nanometer chip. You know, we got to get going in the United States. We need to pass chips yesterday and get to work, uh, uh, you know, with our strategy here on semiconductors, on artificial intelligence, on quantum, on training. You know, as you said, we talked earlier about training. It's vital. Uh, and, and making sure every American has broadband. How do you compete with China? How does a business, com American business compete when so many millions of Americans don't have skills, don't have broadband? It, so these, uh, uh, th these investments, I think, are absolutely vital um, for us to have strength and ability to compete um, and aligning with our allies. I have spent a, a huge amount of time um, in my job aligning with, with Europe showing up in the Indo-Pacific region, you know, pu pulling our allies closer with us and aligning where we can, including on export controls that you mentioned, aligning with our allies on export controls so we can be more effective. I think also the final thing I will say on this is, and this is what the Commerce Department needs to do, is help to level that playing field so American businesses can compete and access the Chinese market. So for example, we are about to launch an initiative the Commerce Department to help American clean tech companies export to China. China will purchase over a trillion dollars of clean tech technology and services in the coming years. They ought to buy that in part from American companies. And so I think that we, we, we have to compete aggressively but we do have to help American companies export to China, do business with China where appropriate and without ever undermining our national security. So Secretary, we just have a couple more minutes. One last question. You mentioned the Indo-Pacific and President Biden has talked about an Indo-Pacific economic framework. Is this, you know, TPP light? What is this? And tell us more about it. And what is the administration's approach to the region? Uh, so we have not been in the region for five years. And by the way, I've traveled numerous times to the region, and they will tell you go to go to Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore. They'll be the first to tell you where have you been, America. And so this is, this is not TPP light. This is a new, I think very ambitious, uh, different, it's not a trade agreement, it's an economic agreement as between us and a dozen countries in the region. I was with President Biden in Tokyo. He launched this with 12 other world leaders. Uh, and it is about working with our partners in the region around infrastructure, which means American capital to the region with infrastructure, uh, decarbonization, American capital to the region with, for decarbonization efforts, um, digital trade, you know, we're talking about cross-border data flows. It would be massively enhancing to their economy and ours if we could have a data flow arrangement as between us and the Indo-Pacific countries. Uh, yeah, supply chain, there's a supply chain pillar. I think there's a great deal of collaboration to be done there uh, as between our country and their countries around supply chains. So it's, um, it is, and I can tell you there's demand, demand for this from India, from Indonesia, from Singapore. What we're not doing is asking them to choose between us and China, but what we are doing is showing up with as much you know, heft and robustness as we can on behalf of the United States government and United States industry to you know, have a much greater economic presence in the region because we need those partnerships. 
Um, and frankly, they need us. They are looking for a hedge. And, you know, China is showing up with buckets of money and we have a lot of um, time to make up for. And so this is what we're doing. Well, Secretary Raimondo, on behalf of everyone who's here, I notice everyone's really staring at the screen. You've held everyone's attention, <laughs> but we're very fortunate to have you uh, doing all the hard work that you're doing on behalf of our country. And so thank you very much for joining us here in Aspen. And good luck. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me.